Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case may be. Uh, this video we're going to start here is for calculus section 1-2, finding limits graphically and numerically. Uh, here first I got a little warm-up question here. Got our function f of x, x squared minus 1 in the numerator, x minus 1 in the denominator. And I'm asking for a couple values. What is f of 3? So in place of the x we plug in a 3. Uh, that becomes 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 1 is 8. Over, we plug a 3 in for this x also. 3 minus 1 is 2. 8 divided by 2 is 4. Four. So f of 3 is equal to 4. Well, that wasn't too difficult. What about f of 1? Well, if we put 1 in the numerator, 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Oh, no big deal. Zeros are allowed in numerators. But the problem is down here. We plug in this x is 1. 1 minus 1 is also 0. Again, we can divide into 0. That's not bad. But dividing by 0 is very bad. And 0 divided by 0 is extra bad. Uh, later, we'll hear that called indeterminate form in the calculus book. Uh, so here we're kind of stuck. We do not have 0 divided by 0. So what we're going to do in this section is try to figure out how this function is behaving as we get close to that naughty number. The naughty number is 1 because that gives us this indeterminate form 0 divided by 0. So since we cannot plug in 1 exactly, we want to plug in numbers very, very close to 1 and see how the function is behaving. Uh, in this video, we're going to just do it with uh, tables of values uh, on a TI-89 or another uh, computer program, and also by looking at the graph. If the graph has been provided, it's always a big help. Uh, the next section, 1-3, we will do some of these same problems, but with an algebraic solution. So here's where the book starts. 1-2, uh, limits numerically and graphically. Three bullet points, estimate a limit from a numerical or graphical approach. We'll learn uh, different ways that a limit can fail to exist. We'll abbreviate that DNE, does not exist. Uh, and then here at the end, study and use a formal definition of a limit. This class is a uh, prep class for the AP test. The AP test does not cover, they will not mention the formal definition of a limit. Uh, we are going to skip that. It can be pretty confusing and involved, especially so close to the start of the calculus course. Uh, maybe after the AP test is over and we're sort of coast into the end of the school year, maybe we'll come back and revisit that. It is interesting and it leads, you know, into some interesting concepts in higher levels of calculus and also real analysis. But back to the task at hand, an introduction to limits. It says here to sketch a graph of this function, x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1, for all values other than 1, we can use a standard cur curve, or curve sketching technique. We could plug in different x values, get the y values, and graph them. At that x equals 1, however, it's not clear what to expect. To get an idea of the behavior of the graph of our function f near this x value, we can use two sets of x values, one set that is approaching one from the left, and another one that's approaching from the right. On the number line, you know that's numbers above and below this value at x is 1. So uh, if we were in class doing this, I'd have you get a TI-89, or maybe we'd do this to a similar problem, not the exact one in the book. Uh, but here are some x values across the top. Again, we cannot plug in 1. We get uh, an unknown output. You know, we cannot divide by 0. So let's pick some numbers close to 1. As we approach from the left, 0.75 is pretty close to 1, and we get a y value of about 2.3. Even closer is 0.9. That gives us a different y value, 2.710. Our y value increased. We get closer. 0.99 is even closer. And we get a y value, 2.970. It went up a little more. Even closer to 1 is 0.999. And we get a y value about 2.997. Now, if we jump to the other side of 1 and approach it from above or the right, we go 1.25, we get a y value 3.8. Closer to 1, though, is 1.1, and we get a smaller y value. It's dropped to 3.3. Uh, if we put a 0 in there, we'll get an even smaller value closer to 1, 1.01, and we get this y value, 3.03. Tuck another 0 in there, you get 1.001, and a y value now changes to 3.003. It has been steadily decreasing. 
So if we look right here, right around that naughty number of 1, we can see how this function is behaving. If we put in a number a little less than 1, we get 2.997. A little bigger than 1, 3.003. .003. Sort of, you know, just mentally take the average. What's right in between 2.99, a little bit below 3 and a little bit above 3? Well, it looks like a 3 would fit in there just nice. So kind of, if we could divide by 0, you know, we'd expect a 3 to pop out of there. But because we get that 0 divided by 0, you know, what's going on in the graph? And here's what's going on numerically in a table. Here's what's going on in the graph. Uh, we've got a cube divided by a first power. When we do all the math on that, it will come out to be a squared or parabolic in shape. Uh, we can plug in all these points because every x value on the x axis is a good one to plug in except 1. When x of 1 goes in, there's nothing there to hit, so we have a hole in the function. But notice the height of that hole on the y-axis, 3. It looks like we would have a y value of 3 if we were allowed to plug in that hole that we have in the function. That is our limit. When you're looking at a graph, most of the time, the limit is going to be the height of that hole on the y-axis, if the limit exists. Let me qualify it with that. Uh, so reading on in the book, uh, the graph of function f is a parabola, has a gap at the point 1, 3, as we just saw in the figure. Although x cannot equal 1, we can move arbitrarily close to 1. And as a result, f of x, our outputs, move arbitrarily close to 3. Using limit notation, we can write it like this. I'm just going to rewrite it down here below. The limit as x approaches 1 of our function, I could write out the whole function again or just put f of x in there. The limit of our function as we approach 1 is equal to 3. Uh, this discussion leads to an informal definition of a limit. If our function f of x becomes arbitrarily close to a single number l as x gets close to number c from either side, then the limit of our function as x approaches that number c is equal to l. Again, that L is a number on the y-axis. And we can write it as follows. You know, here it is with some numbers and an f of x in it. If we write it completely generic, the limit as x approaches some number c of our function f of x is equal to the limit L. And what's this down here? Uh, sort of just a little zoom in. You know, here uh, is our, in our graph with the hole in it. And as we, we approach 1, we cannot use the number 1. But remember, on the table, we used 0.999 and 1.001 to get really, really close to that x value. And our y values were very, very close to that number 3. Example 1. Uh, in the future, we'll see the same uh, function, but we will solve it uh, algebraically. But here we can do it uh, with a graph or a table. Uh, evaluate the function. f of x is x divided by quantity root x plus 1 minus 1. Uh, we're going to evaluate that at several x values near 0 and use uh, the results to estimate the limit. we are also got a little side by side here. We'll also look at it graphically at the same time. So if I pull this out, you know, in class, we could put this in our TI-89 in the Y editor. And we could get some numbers here close. Let me make this even bigger. We could get some numbers real close to 0. So a little bit below 0, negative 0 0.001, negative 0 0.002, negative 0 0.003. On the positive side, 0 0.001, 0 0.002, 0 0.003. Now, of course, at 0, we're going to get that error message from uh, 0 divided by 0. But if we're a little under, we're at 1.99995. And if we're a little bit over, we're at 2.0005. So a mental, what's the average? That's a little bit below 2. That's a little bit above 2. So it sure looks like our limit would equal 2. Now, if we had that in the TID9 and we could get to this table, through the, uh, the f, the function keys, we could also bring up the graph.
Now it'd be hard to determine this by looking at the uh, the pixels on a TID9, but we could use the trace feature. You know, if we graph that, we have this uh, starting point at negative one one, and it opens up like a root function up and to the right. Uh, and over here at zero, we know something's going on in the graph. You won't be able to see a hole in the uh, again in the resolution of a TID9, but we could use the trace feature in the uh, the function menu, and down here we could get our x value very very close uh, to zero. That one e to the negative four, that's just exponential notation. You could use the arrow keys to go back and forth really, really close to zero and see what your y value is uh, close to. Now in example one, note that the function is undefined at zero, yet our function appears to be approaching as we approach zero. This often happens, and it is important to realize that the existence or non-existence of our function at that x value has no bearing on the existence as our function approaches that number. Sometimes limits don't exist. Let's see here, example two. Uh, find the limit of f of x approaches to where f of x equals 1 for x values not equal to 2 and f of x is equal to 0 for all x values equal to 2. Now if they did not provide a graph, let's just think through this. So something's going on at x is 2. Here's x is 2. If we are not at x equals 2, our value of the function is at 1. So here's 1. If we are not at 2, let's say here we're at uh, 1, we're up here at 1. At 0, we're up here at 1. At 3 and 4, we're up here at 1. No matter where we go on the x-axis, as long as we're not at 2, we're up here at a height of 1. So the function would look like that. If we are at x is 2, our output value is 0. So here we are at 2. Our function does hit at 0, but that means there's a hole up here in the graph. So here's graphically what this piecewise function would look like. And now that I've sort of walked through the sketch of it, let's use the good one from the book. Oops, there we go. So here's what the graph looks like. Find the limit as we approach 2. We know that f of 2 is equal to 0. We can get that from up here. But what is the limit as x approaches 2 of this function? So let's see, here we are below it. We're at below 1. We pass 1. We're getting very, very close to 2. We can actually get infinitely close. And we're always right here approaching the hole. If we come in from above, from numbers above 2, we can get very, very close to 2, infinitely close, and we're working our way here, we're approaching the hole. We're approaching it from both sides, so the height of that hole is our limit. Our function is defined, f of 2 is 0, but the limit as we approach that number 2 is equal to 1. Remember, a limit is a number you can pin down on the y-axis. In this case, it is the height of the hole on the y-axis, height of 1. Now, what's this down here? Ah. Uh, so far in the section, we've been estimating limits numerically and graphically. Each of these technique, uh, techniques produces an estimate of that limit. In the next section, we'll study analytic or algebraic techniques to evaluate some limits. Uh, throughout the course, we should try to develop a habit of using a three-prong approach to problem solving. Or you could use one of these to come up with what you think is the solution, and you can always verify your solution with one or both of the other methods. Uh, what we got here are numerical approach. That's our table of values. We can get that right from the calculator. Uh, a graphical approach. We can also get that from the calculator or some problems the graph is provided. Or we can do an analytic approach. You know, sometimes the toughest way to go is analytic. If you do get an answer analytically and you're getting one to check to make sure, you could always do a quick numerical check on the, on the, the table feature or uh, graph it out and see if the graph makes sense with your analytical answer. So this is not from the book. I just come up with this after years of teaching calculus, you know, just to, to really uh, clear up any confusion between a function value and the limit as we approach that same value. And we'll just get these from the graph. 
Uh, and key here is too is a couple vocab words. So f of 2, I'm going to go along my x-axis to 2. Here's 2. If I look down, I don't see the function. If I look up, there's the function. But if I'm going up, I'm going to float, go right through that hole, and I'm going to float off into outer space. Our function, function f, is undefined. Undefined at x is 2. But as we approach 2, you know, what happens as we get close to 2, but not actually using 2 itself? Well, if I'm to the left of 2 underneath, I'm moving along this part of the function, getting close to here. If I come in from numbers above 2, I'm on this part of the function, working my way closer to that hole. We're approaching that hole from both sides. The height of that hole is 3, so that limit is 3. The function is undefined, but the limit still exists. Here at 6, f of 6, we come out here to 6 on the x-axis, and if I look up, there's the function, but I go through the hole, but this time I don't float off into space. I hit this dot. The dot is defined at a height of 7. So f of 6, the function value at 6, is 7. What is the limit as we approach that number 6, though? So let me switch to, I guess, red ink. Uh, here's 6. We're approaching from numbers below 6 to the left. We're working our way up this part of the function toward the hole. If we come in from 7 and work our way down to 6, we're working our way down this part of the function. Again, we're approaching this hole from both sides. That hole on the y-axis has a height of 2. So the function was defined at x is 6, that value was 2, and the function, the limit, as we approach that same x value is a completely different number. So again, functions can be undefined, but the limits exist, and the function can be defined, and the limit could be a completely different number. Uh, now these I set up just to uh, sort of clear, make things a little easier for the next couple examples. Think back to pre-calc. We were doing like sine of a fraction. Here we have 1 divided by this. I don't want to restart now. Get out of the way. Um, how do we divide a numerator divided by a denominator where one or both are fractions? We're going to bring this up and flip it. So if I have 1 over 2 divided by, and notice that pi is distinctly in that denominator with the 3. It's not 2 thirds pi. It's 2 over 3 pi. So I would bring that up and flip it, and I could rewrite it as the sine of 3 pi over 2. And think back to all the fun we had in pre-calc. Here, combine the fractions. Uh, remember the algorithm I taught you in pre-calc. If you have a over b plus c over d, we can multiply the denominators and you get b times d. And multiply, sort of cross multiply up diagonally, that would be a times d. Plus uh, multi cross multiply down this way, c times b or up b times c, b times c. So if we apply that here, we would multiply these denominators together. You would have x times quantity x plus 1. And you'd multiply this denominator up here. 1 times x plus 1 is x plus 1. And then this x times this numerator would be plus another x. Don't cancel like this. We cannot do that. Uh, we could in the numerator combine like terms. x plus x is 2x plus 1 over x times x plus 1. Uh, remember that algebraic stuff there might be helpful in some stuff coming up in this section. Uh, if not in the next couple examples, this will definitely be used uh, in the next section when we do the analytical techniques. Uh, in the next three examples, we're going to see some uh, scenarios where limits fail to exist. We can always abbreviate these DNE does not exist. And 99 times out of 100 in calculus, when you say a limit does not exist, you state which of the three reasons uh, why it fails. Uh, example three, they spoil the surprise. It says here, different right and left behavior. So show that the limit as we approach 0 of our function absolute of x divided by x does not exist. Well, if we started graphing this, I'd say at first, notice this is x divided by x. So anything divided by itself is always going to equal 1. The numerator has bars around it. So the numerator is always going to be a positive. The denominator does not have bars. So the denominator can be 
positive or negative. So in the long run, the only answers that can ever come out of that function are either positive 1 or negative 1. If your numerator is always positive divided by a positive denominator, it's positive. If your numerator is always positive, but this time your denominator is negative, that would make it a negative 1. So this output to this function will always be a 1 or a negative 1. And if we started graphing this one, but let's use the books graph. I'll just pull it out right here. Like, let's use negative 1. If I put negative 1 in the numerator, the bars make it positive, but the denominator stays negative. So that turns into negative 1. If I was out here at negative 2, it would be the absolute of negative 2 over 2, or oh, excuse me, over negative 2. The numerator would go positive, denominator stays negative, and we're still down here at negative 1. That would work for any number over here on the left. Any, no, any number divided by itself, uh, the numerator again is always going to be positive due to the bars. It's always going to turn into a negative 1. So as we're approaching here, we're down here at negative 1. If I try to put in 0, we would have the absolute of 0 over 0. The bars would do nothing because 0 is signless. It lives between positives and negatives. Um, so we would have our indeterminate form 0 divided by 0. We would be undefined. If we come in from numbers above, like positive 2 or positive 1, our numerator is always positive. This time the denominator is also positive. So it becomes a number divided by itself. And the answer there is always positive 1. So we're up here at positive 1. Now I am going to get a little ahead of the book and introduce a little notation that they don't have just yet, but I like to introduce it now. Uh, I think it makes it easier to take some stuff up later. Uh, we can denote, you know, here's our limit as we approach 0. We can uh, further quantify this and we could write this as the limit as x approaches 0. If I put a little minus up here, like almost an exponent, a superscript, there it is, a minus, this means we're coming in from the left or numbers to the left of this number 0 or whatever numbers there. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of our function, absolute of x over x. And we could distinguish that from our limit as x approaches 0 from the right side, from the plus side from the numbers a bigger than whatever this number is. And again, our function is still the absolute of x over x. So we can further distinguish. You know, I will call this our overall limit. We're coming in from the left and the right. Here in blue is our limit just from the left. And here in red is our limit just from the right. Now, if both of these limits from the left and right exist, and they're the same thing, the exact same number, then the overall limit will exist. So let's do this. Uh, I don't want to get rid of the graph here. Uh, in blue, we're approaching 0 from the left side. So here's 0, the y-axis. We are approaching from the left side. Our limit is the height of this hole that limit is negative 1. Switch over to red ink. Uh, the limit as we approach 0 from the right side, from the numbers bigger than 0, we're up here. We're approaching a different hole at a height of positive 1. So now I'm going to get this graph out of the way. So to wrap this all up, the limit from the left is negative 1. The limit from the right is positive 1. Since these limits are approaching different holes, the overall limit, the limit as x approaches 0, I'm not going to put from the plus or the minus, you know, the left or the right on this one. This would be the overall limit. The overall limit as x approaches 0 is a does not exist, a DNE. And the reason is it has different right and left hand behavior. It's approaching two different numbers from the left and the right. Approach two different numbers from left and right. From left and right. And again, what you're going to see graphically is a gap in the graph. 
So here's our naughty number x is 0. Again, that's the y-axis. And our function comes in this way, and then it stops. And then there's a big jump to get back on to that function and keep going. When you have a big gap like that, the limit is it does not exist. It's approaching two different numbers, one number from the left, another number from the right. So the overall limit fails to exist. And graphically, look for the gap. Example four, unbounded behavior. And I like to set this kind of one up with a table also. I don't have my notes with me and I don't see it here. I'm going to sort of just uh, uh, wing this here. Um, we're approaching zero. So let's say we're approaching zero is our naughty number. And our denominator is x squared. Because it's squared, no matter what, it's always going to turn positive. Like if I put in, let's go to the left of zero here, uh, like negative 0.1. If I put in negative 0.1 and I square it, I'll get positive 0.001. And that is in a denominator, and I, and I bring it up and flip it. So again, in my denominator, this would be 1 over, and I would have my po negative 0.1 squared, which turned into a positive 0.001. I think that's right. Yeah, two zeros in there. And that's one one thousandth. I'd bring that up and flip it so that would turn into a positive one thousand. But we can get closer to zero. Negative point oh oh. Or let's just put one oh in there. Point oh oh one. So we would put that in there and square it, and I think we'd get an extra couple of zeros in there. Yeah, four zeros. So that would be what one hundred thousandth or ten thousand you know a much bigger number we could get closer negative point oh, oh get back there point oh oh one and we'd square that we would get a smaller fraction in the denominator bring it up and flip it and the number there would be 10 million or something like that but you can see you know we're getting very very close to zero these are getting shrunk closer and closer and our numbers growing huge a thousand a hundred thousand ten million you know as we're approaching in from this side and because, again, I noticed at the beginning that's x squared, no matter what we put in, positive or negative, we're going to square that to becoming positive. So over here, if we put in a positive 0.1, we're going to get the same output. I think it was 1,000. If we put in positive 0.01, we'll get the same 100,000. If we put in the positive 0.001, I think it'll be 10 million. You know, so it, no matter what side we're approaching from, a thousand, a hundred thousand, ten million, as we're jumping, leapfrogging closer and closer to that naughty number, we're taken off like a rocket. So if we graph a few of these points or have this function on our TID9, it's going to look something like this. Again, because we're squaring everything, it all everything becomes positive. I like to call it the volcano graph. As it's going up, looks like we got a volcano. Just draw some lava coming down. But let's talk about the notation on this. Uh, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of our function, 1 over x squared, um, it's going up, up, up. It's heading to positive infinity. As we come in from the other side, the limit as x approaches 0 from the plus side, from the right, of our function 1 over x squared, that's also come along and it's going up and up and up. It's heading for positive infinity. Now I said if it, you know, if there, it's approaching two different numbers, uh, the limit fails to exist. Here it's not approaching the same number. Infinity is not a number; it's a concept. So here the limit from the left is to infinity. The limit does not exist unbounded behavior or some books call it infinite behavior. So here from the left DNE unbounded. Here as we come in from the right also to the same positive infinity it is DNE unbounded.
When we do get to the section where the book formally introduces the limits from the left and the right, you know, if you run into one of these one-sided unbounded limits, you know, the book will want to know, are you heading to positive or negative infinity? You know, so it's a good habit to get into, are you heading to positive or are you heading to negative infinity? But in either case, you know, infinity is not a number, the limit does not exist, and the reason it does not exist is unbounded behavior. One more to go. Uh, oscillating behavior. Uh, in my class, it's a math class, it's not spelling class, uh, you will not lose points if you misspell oscillating. As long as you're pretty close and I can see what your intent was, starts with maybe an OSC and ends in an ing, I'll probably give you credit for uh, misspelling oscillating. I'm more concerned with the concepts uh, than the spelling. So discuss the existence of the limit of x approaches 0 of sine 1 over x. Now they do give us a table here. Whoa, and we're just going to look at one. I forgot I have that sort of covered up there. Oh, nice. Uh, we're only going to look at the one side of it here because it will be the same on the other. So we've got sine of 1 over x. And here's why I sort of had that little warm-up thing. Our first x value, and let me point out also here, uh, these fractions, as we're moving this way, our numerators are twos, so that's not changing, and our denominators are growing, 1 pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi, 9 pi, 11 pi. As the numerator stays consistent and our denominator sh uh, grows bigger and bigger, our fraction gets smaller and smaller. So we are heading for zero. So in this case, it says, you know, the limit as x approaches 0. That is where we are headed with these weird-looking uh, fractions that they've picked for our x values. But you will see the method to the madness shortly. So if I plug in this x value, 2 over pi, down here it's 2 over pi. But that flips up, and now it is the sine of pi over 2. So think back to all the fun in pre-calc. Here we are at pi over 2 on the unit circle. Uh, that point would be 0, 1. Our sine value at pi over 2 is 1. If we go to the next x value, 2 over 3 pi. So now it's 2 over 3 pi. When we bring that up and flip it, now it's the sine of 3 pi over 2. We're down to the bottom of the unit circle where our point would be 0, comma, negative 1. Our sine value there is our y value, so now it's negative 1. We move to the next x value, 2 over 5 pi, so now this is a 5. Bring it up and flip it, so now it is the sine of 5 pi over 2. At 5 pi over 2, we just do another lap. We're back at the top of the unit circle, 0, divide, or 0 comma, 1. Our y value is, again, 1. 7, or excuse me, 2 over 7 pi, that's going to come up and flip, so now it is 7 pi over 2. We're back at the bottom of the unit circle, where our sine value is back to negative 1. So at what at first looked like weird x values to be using for this limit approaching 0, uh, it's a neat way to get our answers right off the unit circle. And as we're working our this way, we are approaching 0. And look what's happened to our outputs. 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. If we keep going, 1, negative 1, we could do that all the way at, to infinity, getting infinitely close to 0. And we are just flip-flopping back between two of the, uh, different numbers. Uh, we're flip-flopping back and forth, or we are oscillating, oscillating between two numbers. Uh, if we think back to some of our other graphs, like, where is that? Here. We were approaching the same value on the y-axis. As we come in from this side, as we come in from the other side, here we were approaching that same hole at the height of 3. Here, we are not approaching one number. We're oscillating back and forth. Uh, here's the graph. If you try this on a T89, the, the calculator don't hand, won't handle this very well um, because, you know, as we're moving closer and closer to the origin, we're getting infinitely close. The oscillation of the graph is increasing. The closer we get to the origin, the oscillation increases to almost an infinite pace. So, of course, the T89 is going to have some squigglies going through the origin. It has a little 
will freak out when it divides by zero. Uh, but what we have is we're going back and forth between one and negative one. And here, you know, if I just pick here would be negative one half. Between negative one half and the origin, you could have infinitely many oscillations. I could cut it even closer. I could go over here to the positive one tenth. Between one tenth and the origin will be infinitely many oscillations. So a limit should be converging on a single number that we can pin down on the y-axis. Here we're bouncing around like a madman. You know, uh, uh, we're going back and forth between two numbers. We're not homing in on one of them or the other. So the limit is, uh, let me write it out uh, formally here, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 1 over x is a does not exist does not exist and the reason is due to oscillating behavior oscillating behavior so our three reasons uh, different behavior from the left and the right unbounded behavior and oscillation oh here they are common types of behavior associated with the non-existence of a limit uh, f of x our function approaches different numbers from the left and the right side uh, 2. f of x increases or decreases without boundary as x approaches c. There's our unbounded behavior. Uh, and also f of x oscillates between two fixed values as x is approaching c. Uh, technology pitfall. Let me make that a little bigger. Uh, when you use a graphing utility to investigate the behavior of a function near an x value at which you were trying to evaluate a limit, remember you can't always trust the graph that that function uh, graphing utility can draw. When you use a graphing utility to graph that from example 5 over an interval containing that x value 0, you'll most likely contain an incorrect graph such as the one shown below. Uh, the reason is a graphing utility cannot show the correct graph is that the graph is in, it has infinitely many oscillations over any interval containing that number zero. Now the left one, they look like they're zoomed out pretty far. We can see all uh, x and y values go from 10 to negative 10. So we see the function comes along here. It just got a little squiggle around the origin. If we zoom in closer to investigate, now along the x-axis, we're going from negative 0.25 to positive 0.25, and our y values are between 1.2 and negative 1.2. We see these like little lightning bolt squigglies. That's the calculator freaking out, because again, there are supposed to be infinitely many oscillations and actually right at the origin is 0 divided by 0. So always with a calculator, uh, take that technology with a grain of salt. They are useful, uh, but they're not flawless. Uh, this I've thrown in is just an odd number out of the book to uh, you know, sort of do in class. It's kind of like the one I made up in the middle of the slideshow here. This is, it's in our new book, it's probably not page 75, number 22, but this is somewhere in the exercise set for our section 1-2. Uh, if you want to, you can pause the video and try to answer these. You know, again, make the distinction between the function value f of and the limit as you approach. Uh, if it does not exist, give me which one of the three reasons why. So again, pause the video and then try the problem and then start it. See if you got the right. You didn't pause the video, did you? You just want to hear the answers, don't you? All right, here we go. F at negative 2. Whoa, where'd my ink go? There we go. F at negative 2. I come to negative 2. Here we are. If we look up, there is no function. We don't hit it. We look down. There is no function. The blue dotted line is uh, a clue that there is a vertical asymptote there. So for a function, a function is undefined. Undefined. But what is the limit as we approach negative 2? Now notice they didn't say from the left or the right, so they're not making that distinction. But if we are approaching negative 2 from the left, we're heading down here to negative infinity. If we approach negative 2 from the right, we're headed up here to positive infinity. So if a left-hand limit is negative infinity unbounded, a po or a right-handed limit would be positive infinity unbounded, but here just the overall limit, we're just going to write DNE unbounded. Because it's different unbounded from the left and the right, we won't make that the distinction. The book didn't ask us to, but in the future we'll be talking about that. Uh, C, F at 0. So here we are at zero. If we start going up, there is the function there, but we go right through the hole and we keep going. But luckily we hit this point so we don't drift off into space. F of zero is equal to four. But what's the limit as we approach zero? So again, here's zero, the y-axis. If we're approaching from the left, we're down here at 
6.5 it looks like. If we're approaching from the right, we're up here at 4. So, and if you look at the graph, we do have this big gap in the graph. A gap in the graph means the limit is going to be a DNE. DNE and the reason of the three would be the first one. We're approaching two different numbers. We're approaching one number from the left, a different number from the right. We've got a big gap in the graph. Our function does not exist. Next up, E, F of 2. We go to 2 on the x-axis. We start going up. We go right through the hole, and we float off into space. So that function is undefined. But what's the limit as we approach 2? So here's 2. If we approach from the left, we're approaching that hole. If we approach from the right, we are approaching the same hole. So it'll be the same from the left and the right. The limit exists, and it's the height of the hole on the y-axis. Uh, we're going to have to estimate that one. Call it a half. So our limit is equal to a half. Even though the function was undefined, the limit exists at a half. F of 4, letter G. We go out to 4. Here's 4. We go up. We hit the dot. We take it over to the y-axis. The height of that dot on our y-axis is 2. F of 4 is equal to 2. What's the limit as we approach 4, though? Well, if we're approaching 4 from the left, we're on this part of the function riding up. If we're approaching 4 from above, from the right, we're on this part of the function. We're also riding up. Looks like a volcano. We're heading up. On either side, we're heading up to infinity. So now, remember, for the limit, we don't say the limit is infinity. The limit does not exist because infinity is not a number. Infinity is a concept. We can never get to infinity. There's always one more step. And I think that's the end of the slideshow. I think I have an old warm-up on there or something. Yeah, just some odd problems. All righty. I will see you in the next video.